There's so much energy in the room. I like that, and I feel bad for killing it. Uh, but I promise you, the panel is worth it. And I'd like to present you first the moderator of the panel, Oren Kloss. He's a sen senior scientist at Recursion and has worked on uh, different drug discovery projects for the past few years. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, yeah, so I'm Oren, I'm a senior scientist at Recursion. Uh, about two years ago, I made the brave move to move from Toronto to Montreal to be the first hire here at Recursion's Vila office. Um, and previously, I did my PhD in Toronto and uh, co-founded a phenomic drug discovery company there. Um, for the start of the panel, we're going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and just say a few sentences about their backgrounds. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm Yashua Benjil. I'm a um, computer scientist, and uh, I mostly focus on machine learning, deep learning, jointed models. Um, and in the last few years, uh, I started working on Molecules. Um, hi, everyone. Maureen Kazitnik. I'm an assistant professor of biomedical informatics at uh, Harvard. Um, computer scientist by training, but worked in computational biology since my early PhD days. We are very interested in uh, ways to develop uh, fundamental AI to accelerate our understanding of genomic medicine and therapeutic design as well. Hello, Dominique Bianni, you know me. Um, I work uh, most, I've been at Valence for the past four years uh, and I've worked on like uh, drug discovery using graph neural networks to model small molecules. Hi, I'm Georg Arne Klevert, um, or go by Oco typically. So I'm a computer scientist. I'm leading the machine learning research group at Pfizer um, since half a year now before and I was the last seven years at Bayer and they are built up every, basically the same. Yeah? Number of years, I've uh, been with University of Montreal for 30 years. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the first question to get the panel started is um, if you can describe in a few sentences how you envision the future of uh, ML for molecular research. All right, uh, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> All right. Um, so so I, I, I really think that. Uh, as I said this morning, there, there's like huge opportunities to advance uh, actually many areas of science. I think uh, maybe molecules is one of the uh, most exciting in terms of uh, positive applications. Um, in, the, in the last few years, we've been developing a particular kind of uh, generative models that some of you heard about, the generative flow networks or G-flow nets, which are different from the usual uh, generative models in that they're not trained to fit a data set, they're trained to match a given function. So think of like an energy function. If you're uh, uh, thinking physics, uh, you, you, you learn like an MCMC sampler if you want, but it's gonna be very efficient, just a, a neural net uh, sampling data. Um, or you can think of that function as a reward function. Uh, and, and what the, the thing does is it's gonna sample proportionally to that, that reward function. So if the reward is e to the minus energy, We'll sample from that. So we've been using that mostly in the last few years for active learning in order to sample a diversity, uh, a diverse set of, uh, of molecules that have uh, some uh, predicted property of interest. Um, but uh, what we're working on now is applying uh, these and extending these to the setup um, of, of um, Bayesian modeling. So, um, and, 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 you know, just not just proposing new molecules, but being able to better understand, for example, the causal structure or the dynamics and uh, doing things, you can use these things also for marginalization. In other words, uh, you, want, you may want to ignore some aspects of the, of the space and you want to be able to answer questions about uh, a subset of, of the variables, or uh, you want to be able to sample things like confirmations. Um, and you want to do it also in a way that captures the fact that there's a finite amount of data. Even the internet is not big enough. Um, and you, if you, you're not careful, you end up with hallucinations like we see with the chat GPT. So the, the solution in principle is well known in machine learning. It's to use Bayesian posteriors, but up to now it's, you know, it was considered to be not computationally tractable uh, or requiring incredible approximations that are not reasonable, like unimodal distributions. But it turns out that with these 
uh, particular kinds of generative models, um, we can train neural nets that generate uh, Bayesian posteriors, for example, over uh, chemical theories or biological theories like uh, causal, uh, you know, dependencies, um, or um, the, you know, what are the reasons that particular molecules would uh, bind and things like this. Uh, the things that usually scientists have been doing by hand by like, you know, chemists or biologists trying to figure out understanding what is going on. So now we can use these models to generate theories similar to uh, how humans do it. And, um, and, 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 and as I said this morning, this is really on the path towards developing a toolbox to uh, uh, bring about really large scale AI systems that, um, that will be able to do the sort of things that human scientists do. We're not there yet, but this is sort of the, the goal. Yeah, so um, I would start with, uh, there is this principle it's called scientific method so that scientists have used to systematically and logically understand uh, the world. And it has largely been the same for the last three, 400 years. And I feel that now we are at that time where we can think of fundamentally rethinking the process of how science is done by integrating and developing core <clears throat> AI algorithms that can help scientists um, at the various stages, <clears throat> sorry, of scientific process. And that includes um, both collecting data um, as well as interpreting data sets, <clears throat> generating AI driven hypothesis, and then integrating those predictions uh, with uh, robotics or some other physical systems in order to enable um, understanding or advance our understanding beyond scientific discovery um, or and do that in a way that goes beyond what current or traditional scientific methods could do alone. And so more concretely, I see lots of opportunities in areas that would go and connect chemistry with biology and ultimately affect uh, the human body. So we know that many diseases that affect humans are not driven by alterations in single individual genes or one protein that would, could explain the diversity of disease phenotypes we see in real world patients. And so with that understanding in mind, what becomes important is to think of what kind of structural changes we see um, <clears throat> at the individual protein levels, how those proteins then at the different scale interact with each other in a given cell and how those cells communicate with each other to give rise to cell types and cell states that ultimately can drive the disease and are responsible for also for the onset of the disease. So I'm particularly very excited about models that would be multi-scale models in nature that would be able to connect this chemistry-driven model with more of the biology to derive then better mechanisms of actions or these causal structures that could help us better see whether we have these dysregulated processes in the disease that could be targeted with novel therapeutics. And so what I mean is important for that is in a way contextualized learning where we need to be aware or our models need to be in some way take into account what is the environment, in meaning cell or cell type or disease context within which, within which that specific protein or sets of proteins actually act. It's known that the function and roles of proteins can vary by those disease and cell state context. And so in order to be able to then model and derive hypotheses that are therapeutically valid, it's important to have this contextualization in mind. Um, but kind of very broadly, I think this view of taking a forward looking approach where it is like the chemistry of the molecules, but then biology of the human body taken together uh, can then help us design better therapies, particularly then at the individual personalized level, which is something that we are not considering uh, today at all, right? Um, and I think that's quite exciting. So how do I envision the future of ML for uh, molecular design and especially for drug discovery? Uh, I, I will use the hype word now, uh, foundation models. <laughs> uh, but it's not about a single model here that I'm talking about. Like, I don't think we will see um, just like a chat GPT, that, but for molecules, uh, what we will need is really a, having different types of foundational models. Some that really try to tackle the physics, other the chemistry, other the biology, um, and how do we link them together? 
but also how we enable uh, you link them together, then you, you do get the chat GPT of uh, <laughs> biology and chemistry. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. But like, if you see a foundation model, for example, as like the the um, like uh, the engine of uh, an airplane, well, you still need another foundation model to be the wings and another ones to be the wheels, and you still need uh, to put everything together. Mm -hmm. And we have like, um, so this is something that, that will require massive efforts, both from academia and from industry, where academia can really help build, uh, build on top of those foundation models, build tools, build application that can cover everything that we need to do, but where industry will have to push on like the engineering of assembling everything together uh, into the airplane that we need to, um, to help navigate like the, the space of uh, molecular design. <clears throat> I, uh, I have a very um, industry um, centric view on that. Um, so foundation models are super important for us. And yes, I also believe having a very powerful model that can take on to count like all the rig representations, the target representation and the essay representation can learn mm -hmm. everything across the sales coming from DNA code libraries, high throughput screens, phenotypic screens coming from cell painting data. It's something that will be definitely the future. We are an industry have lots, I mean, you cannot imagine millions of compounds tested on thousands of high throughput screens. And um, so combining everything is the place industry to be, we can do that. So I don't believe so much in the usage of generative models at the current stage. So generating compounds is not the bottleneck in industry. So um, chemists trained and experienced chemists can easily do that. And coming up with any score-based method that can optimize it maybe and coming up with a conformal conformation, conformer that has an energable, favorable um, conformation is something, yeah, it's nice, but it will not be a breakthrough or change everything. Hmm? Thanks. Um, so the next question is, uh, in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge in enabling an ML revolution for molecular design? Um, I'll start. So uh, from my opinion, like one of the biggest challenge is about having uh, models that are both reliable, but also explainable. Um, it will be extremely difficult, even if we have a very, very good model, to deploy it uh, in industry and in real drug discovery programs if it's an entire black box. Uh, what we need is like to enable the chemists and the biologists that, that really work on these problems to uh, be able to understand what's happening and why. And the same is also true for uh, material design. But I'd say it's even more true, for example, for drug design, where uh, if you want to submit a drug to the FDA, well, they will ask you what the pathway is and what it does. And it's not just about like identifying pathways, but really explaining like why a prediction was made. And that way, like the chemist's, uh, the, the, the chemist's intuition can go on and fill up the holes that uh, the machine learning model could not do. And uh, as uh, Oko was saying, like they then generate the molecules uh, that would improve on that even more. Uh, let, let me add a few things here. This, I think, going in great directions. Um, a lot of the tools that we have built and that have been very successful in uh, machine learning, deep learning, in science, and you know, uh, helping us with molecules are um, relying on, say, essentially supervised learning or generative models um, that in both cases directly fit the data that we observe. And that makes these uh, systems very, very strongly dependent on the amount of data. And, 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 we, you know, and we are struggling to collect more data and so on. And, and this will happen and it will help for sure. But, um, as, uh, as we heard this morning um, about open fold, sometimes inductive biases, in other words, 
um, ways to design these systems can make a huge difference in terms of their sample complexity. In other words, how many examples you need. And um, I think that one of the approaches that is going to make it easier for scientists to put in uh, uh, domain knowledge is um, when we uh, change from this end-to-end -end, uh, training to fit the data, which is what the current kind of dominant framework in machine learning, to what I would call model-based machine learning. So in a way the work, for example, that's uh, centered around discovering causality is more in that direction. And the idea is we break the problem essentially in, you can think of it as in, in two parts. One is, a, uh, think of a neural net whose job is not to answer questions, not to make predictions, but rather to build a sort of understanding of what is going on. Like uh, build a, a theory or like a causal structure, but it, it could be uh, capturing the dynamics or something else uh, uh, that, that really helps to um, uh, explain the data. And, um, and then once we have that, and, and, and you know, it's not easy, and there are lots of complications, technical complications, uh, including the fact that there may be multiple models, multiple theories that are compatible with the data, then we can train uh, predictors, you know, things that answer the questions we care about, to be consistent with those models. In fact, this is mostly how scientists operate. Um, uh, we, I mean, sometimes we just develop an intuition for what is right, and it's kind of directly going from an observation to an answer. But what we, what we try to do uh, when we write papers is come up with an explanation, uh, and then going from that explanation, like a theory, if you want, to uh, something that computes answers for particular questions. So we can separate these two things. The advantage is that the inference machine, the thing that answers question, um, can be trained on, in a way, infinite amount of data. So it, it just wants to be consistent with the model. Whereas when, with the traditional approach, um, you, your, uh, your predictor or something is, uh, can't have capacity greater, like, then um, what, what, what it prevents overfitting on, on the given data. Um, so to give an example, you know, why, what is he talking about? Let me tell you about AlphaGo. Like everybody knows that there was this Go playing system invented by DeepMind a few years ago that you know, beats the world champions. And in AlphaGo, if you ask, you know, what is the knowledge? Like, what is the understanding of the game? Um, what is the world model? It's just the rules of the game. And it's about one page, like nine rules. So the model is very small. It's something very interpretable. Now, in AlphaGo, we know those rules, okay? But imagine you didn't know them and you observe people playing and you try to figure them out. You wouldn't need a lot of capacity to represent that. Then what, what they did at DeepMind is they trained the question answering machine, the thing that makes predictions. It tells you how to play so as to maximize uh, you know, points. And, and that can be infinitely large because there's, it's, it's not trying to fit data. Initially, they try to imitate humans playing the game. So that's like the traditional way of doing things today. But then they, they just trained it with self-play to be consistent with the, the model, with the rules. And there is just compute that limits how uh, much capacity we want to put in the, in the machine that does inference, that answers question. So this is a very different kind of um, uh, sort of machine learning frame that um, I think better suits what scientists have been doing, I mean, human scientists, and, and could be advantageous for like fundamental reasons in the application of machine learning and science. Um, yeah. The problem um, in drug discovery is that we have a very, very slow feedback loop. So um, if you want to think about the design max tech cycle, so you come up with a design compound, you test and you make it and then test it, then it's maybe three months. If you have like a dedicated project team, it's maybe one month. Um, and then you have all the resources there. So um, I, I, I believe that we cannot integrate such a feedback loop in such a system. So I still believe the biggest bottleneck right now is like to come up with very reliable models that come up with a confidence score and their predictions or that scientists can and it does not sound sexy, I know it, but it's, it's reality how it is. And so that allows us to, to work on real super large still virtual screens 
on billions of compounds that can incorporate knowledge from other large noisy measurements, everything, and then that's it. Uh -huh. And that's still the biggest challenge, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that was said. So perhaps like, let me in, reinterpret something in, in, in slightly different words. I, I think there are bottlenecks that are algorithmic and there are some bottlenecks that are practical uh, in nature. So practical in nature means like for, for many students, researchers working in the field, it relates to two things, which is first, what is the data that we have and is available? And whether those data that are available and exist in public domain or are available to academic institutions really reflect true bottlenecks that limit the discovery rate uh, in therapeutic science and in drug discovery and development pipeline. And that's not obvious at all, that some of the data sets and benchmarks that we are seeing now so prominently used and repeatedly used in many, many NeurIPS, iClear, ICML papers are really tackling the challenges that are the current biggest bottlenecks. If we look at the discovery pipeline and see what are the areas, what are the stages and specific tasks where there is the highest high failure rate and the least amount of existing methods and perhaps the least amount of domain knowledge where AI methods could be most helpful. In. There are numerous settings where we can design, and I'm very happy about doing that as a machine, machine learning scientist, really powerful ML models, but then we go with to experimentalists and the feedback we often get is that, well, it's great, you get your AU rock and it's really high, it's close to perfect performance. Why are those methods not used routinely in practice? Have you ever wondered why we have so many methods achieving near perfect accuracy, for example, for problem that I will refer to as drug repurposing, which is concerned with late stage of drug development where there is a drug or novel compound already that passed through clinical trials. And the question is whether it can be repurposed and reused for different indications. There are many, many ML algorithms that achieve close to perfect accuracy on benchmark data set. They're not used routinely in practice. Why is that the case? And so if one look at some of those predictions, they are what we would, what experimentalists would say trivial. While they are correct from the AML standpoint, they're the kind of hypothesis that a domain expert would immediately think of. So then the value of AI prediction is that somewhat limited. So, so kind of from the practical considerations, the challenges I see are related to data availability and not only data in the sense of what goes as input to train an ML model, but also what are meaningful formulation of ML tasks that correspond to current bottlenecks in the discovery pipeline. The, the, on the other end of the, pipe, of, of the AI pipeline is the output, right? So currently the way models are evaluated is mainly on kind of test data sets. Sometimes those test data sets are blinded, but what we would really need is go more towards self-driving labs or a way where those models would more directly trans translate or be integrated with experimental workflows and then, then close this loop. And that's really, really hard. It would be great to have that, but it's really hard as Oka mentioned because this process is so, so long. Um, and so those are questions from the that are of a really practical nature that I feel are limiting kind of the kind of questions we are focusing on in academia and academic research. And there are also very interesting, exciting algorithmic challenges and, and kind of, I'm personally very excited about ways to algorithms that could help us expand the scope of the chemical space that has been probed or investigated or searched for drug-like molecules. So we know that this, the size of the chemical space is, is incredibly large. It has this astronomical size of 10 to the power of 60 chemicals that might have some drug-like properties. Of those around 10 to the power of five, around 10,000 are FDA approved drugs. So just imagine the gap between the size of the chemical space versus the approved drugs. So nevertheless, the humanity has advanced so much over the last century with and been able to treat so many diseases with relatively small number of, of available therapies. So I'm very excited about AI techniques that would be able to kind of have somewhat explorative power or be able to somewhat generalize better to the kind of inputs that are different than the inputs that the model has seen before. And in many ways, I think that the, the way to approach that is to reason more at the level of mechanisms uh, that would tell us what are classes of compounds, classes then of diseases 
that in, in what are their mechanisms of actions and, and then effectively use that as some generalizable principle. Um, and in doing so, like just increasing that space of, 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 ther ther of therapeutics by a tiny amount, just imagine how many more diseases as humanity would, we would be able to treat um, that are today non-treatable or, or, or very hard to treat. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I want to follow up on one thing you said about the ML models being used in practice. Uh, so one of the questions we had in mind was um, how can we enable ML models to be deployed uh, and used by domain experts in a better way? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Like, what? How can we um, enable um, domain experts to use ML models like in a more integrated way? Yeah, so, well, that's a, an important question. There are lots of possible potential answers to that. So. So sometimes that relates just to being as a, a society is being very open and, and in a way attend con conferences from other fields and be able to converse, communicate and interact with scientists across disciplines. It's encouraging to see that there are more and more venues, both in terms of publication as well as meetings for scientists from different disciplines to come together. Fundamentally, I think what is needed there is that both sides or if we think of now someone who develops algorithms versus a domain expert or experimentalist who would use outputs of those algorithms, need to be able to communicate with each other, meaning understand each other at least, at least at the level that they speak the same language. And so that requires a bit of effort on both sides. I still vividly remember when I was um, in high school reading some papers and, and there was a biology paper and a biology paper, it was about victors in libraries. And my understanding of victors at that time was victors in terms of elements of victor space. But there are also victors in chemistry and in biology. And it was very hard to understand this paper because my mindset my, was completely different than the kind of mindset that and, and discussion in that specific paper. So there is lots of opportunities or needs to create these cross-disciplinary uh, bridges. Practical challenges then also relate to um, I would say just establishing confidence and trust um, and seeing and providing a clear case for what's the value that the model would bring to an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, many of these decisions are, are high stakes decision making problems, right? So as, as Alka mentioned before, if a model makes a prediction and it takes then three months, six months, X number of months and lots of money to test that prediction, there will be lots of discussion about which prediction should we act upon. Uh, and, and many of models that we're today developing don't have this capability. And, and I think that's a very important question about finding out and prioritizing AI generated hypotheses to arrive with a few that are worthwhile pursuing further. I just want to add that uh, what I was discussing earlier that I called model-based machine learning lends itself uh, much more easily to have domain experts provide constraints or preferences um, into things that correspond to their understanding their theory. So think about, um, uh, you know, um, knowledge we, we may have from, from the low level physics or from the biology uh, about the causal mechanisms or about the dynamics um, or about particular constraints uh, that have to do with uh, um, uh, the chemistry, the, the, there's, there's lots of constraints, for example, we, we have from chemistry about what, what is feasible, what is not feasible, and so on, that is very easy to put in the language of models of like how things work, and is difficult often to put in the language of oh, the predictor that I'm, I'm training. And people have been successful at things like invariances and equivariances, but there are other things that are not so easy to uh, put in that form. And um, if we go with this model-based machine learning route, we learn a model or a distribution over models to be more precise. Um, and that is also the language that the scientists, the domain scientists uh, speak. So it's gonna be much easier to deal with interpretability to explain a kind of a human and understandable story for you know, what is it that the model has learned than uh, with the, the current approaches. So yeah, I, I, I think we can take inspiration from how humans um, approach science, how human brains um, function when they uh, generate theories, when uh, 
the um, you know handle uncertainty, um, uh, epistemic uncertainty in particular, as inspiration to redesign the way that we're doing machine learning for science. I think it's super crucial to integrate, um, especially in the context of generated chemistry or whatever. I mean, it's you know chemistry really early on. So, I mean, it's like a human centric ideation process that start there. And those specialists, they have so much experience knowledge. They can really, an experienced medicinal chemist can evaluate certain property just by eyeballing on the molecule. I'm not kidding. So, it's, they can do that. And if you want to provide some solutions, such as some molecules or something like that, I mean, you'll be very careful with them because they will really laugh you out for some reason because they will just say, oh man, this will explode. It cannot even synthesizable. So really, I would really always encourage everyone to work together with those people. I mean, they have to be also fair and, and maybe and they also accept that as a medicinal, even as an experienced medicinal chemist, you cannot trade off all property, properties of a molecule at one time. And you maybe even don't know it. So coming up with tools that allow them to do multiple objective optimization on molecules, they will love it. They will really like it. And, but you have to build up very trustful and also explainable solution for it. But there are tools out there to do that. We have shown that also, and there's a strong interest in pharmaceutical research to, to collaborate with people. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add on like what everything said about integrating the, the human feedback and such thing. And uh, the, the question that uh, I want to bring or like uh, the topic I want to bring is like human in the loop, direct integration into the model. How do we bring that on? Um, and this is very different from like traditional generative design. And we have seen, for example, with DALI uh, that was able to generate images uh, just by text. Everyone was like, oh, artists are dead, artists are, are dead. But in the end, people were using DALI just to generate memes. Uh, where the value was is when Photoshop announced Firefly, where the artist could, in, could directly communicate with the model via both like drawing uh, on the picture and by uh, communicating with natural language with the model. This is where the biggest, biggest value is. It's now you have an artist, but the artist is uh, 10 times faster, 100 times faster. He's able to iterate much more efficiently with what it wants to do. And I think here it's not only uh, as important, it's even more important in the case of like molecular design uh, because it's much more complex. It has many, much more tasks to accomplish many more level as we discussed earlier from physics to chemistry to biology. And how do we integrate human in the loop there? It's a very, very difficult question. Do we use natural language? Do we use drawing? on uh, protein 3D structures, or do we invent like totally different things uh, to help enable that? I think that that's one of the biggest questions, but one certainty is like, we need human in the loop. How do we make that happen? Yeah, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we're gonna open it up to audience questions now. So uh, yeah, please step up to the mic if you have a question. The mic over there. Um, hi, and thank you for the good answers and like good quick question from Oren. So I'm actually three questions and like across like the different panelists from Yushua and everybody else. So the first thing is uh, the lady, she said, she talked about uh, human interaction. I mean, human body interaction and all those type of things. And they, I think we even still don't know like how maybe T cell functions, how like how cell, interaction, protein, protein interactions, like we don't even know what are the possibilities of like bacterial phages in the antimicrobial peptide, uh, like antimicrobial resistant, like challenge, all those type of things. So, so many unknown and, and answered questions. So how do we actually pretend to be willing to teach artificial model to help us in that direction, understanding those dynamics? Um, the second question is more toward- like I suggest we do one at a time. <laughs> okay, uh, great question. And you're absolutely right. Biological data is fundamentally incomplete and very noisy. 
for example, for the human protein interaction network, which is a network of protein coding genes um, where edges between indicate protein contacts. It's estimated to be around 20 to 30% complete. Um, and so meaning that if you go to every pair of proteins and only limit yourself to those proteins that are directly encoded by genes, so no isoforms, um, only 20 to 30% of protein pairs have been experimentally tested for interaction. And we know that that interactions are dynamic, they can vary across cell types and contexts, and, and that's much, much more or less unknown. And, and so you're absolutely right. So our models naturally need to take that into account. You could also think it would be helpful to train or develop models that would be able to say, I don't know, um, or, or effectively say, but there is just not enough data or there is, uh, there is conflicting evidence, which is also often the case in science, especially at areas that are close to frontier of discovery, where you can see that there's some discovery for which there is some number of studies that, that show evidence for it and some number of studies potentially equally um, prestige in their journal publications or equally uh, rigorous in their experimental effort showing that, that, that interaction, for example, is not happening. And, and so that's something that's an open problem in a way. There, is also, there are also various biases in the data that are highly non-random. For example, the, the amount of data available around certain genes correlates very nicely with NIH funding cycles. Um, and that has been shown, and there's a really nice nature paper showing how you, if one would simply look at uh, the degree of, of, of proteins in these networks, um, you would see that those high degree proteins tend to be those proteins that NIH has been focusing on, and you can do that for every decade. And, and that's what high degree will tell you. And, and that was, for example, one bias that is back in around 2000, even the community to come up with the idea that high degree nodes are essential genes. And now that's kind of not, not, does not seem to be the case. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that other than there are problems and challenges to address, but um, yeah, fundamentally I think like uncertainty quantification is important. Okay, um, I have another audience member ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah I, I see I tried to okay. have a few questions. Okay, so the second question was related to like model-based networks because um, um, even from, even like causal models, they learn like from like what, observational in, or from like interventional data. So those relationships that we expect them to uh, discover or to understand are actually even data dependent. So uh, everything we are now building nowadays depends somehow or at some level on data. So how do you think, or uh, yes, how do you think we could build like those type of like model-based networks? Like, do we have maybe to come up with something like maybe imagining a kind of giant model kind of unifying every single aspect of the things if yes how far are we potentially from it because there was also there's also like the agi debate which people are now seeing to be more closer and closer i mean view differ but yeah so so of course you need data i mean scientists need data as well um although in some cases you can you can go back to the physics, right? So in, in some you know in many cases in chemistry we can run um, uh, quantum uh, uh, chemistry calculations um, and so that okay that doesn't really answer your question, but it's not just data; it's also <coughs> things we know that we can exploit in building the model. So it could be data, and it could be all kinds of things we know, including uh, low-level physics equations. But now going back to the main question about um, uh, how are these models going to be represented? So the thing that I have in mind and that we started working on is that it's not that's going to be a neural net that is your model. Like that's what people always think. That's what we do now. Okay, we, we train a neural net that is a model. That's not at all what I have in mind. What I have in mind is more like the way scientists do it. So what's going on is that, yes, there's a neural net, like their brain, but what their brain is doing, or like what a GFlow net might be doing, is to generate the model, to generate a theory. So like think of generating an equation that describes the data or generate, generating the causal graph that, that explains the data, right? So there is no neural net that is the model. 
what you have is a distribution over models, say over theories or graphs or things that explain the data. And the neural net part, which is also generative, is something that you can sample from. And when you do that, you get a theory that is that has a high prior probability. In other words, it's consistent with the things we knew from the domain and fits the data well. And maybe there are multiple theories. In general, there will be multiple theories. But so your sampler will be able to generate all the good theories, just like you know, currently GFLNets are used to sample all the, the good candidates, say, for a particular um, molecule problem. Yeah, we have time for one last question. So let's let the next person ask. Thanks. Hi guys. Um, so, so I guess the you know this kind of comes back to the question of you know interfacing with people who are going to use models and computational biology. I feel like computational biology, like I think Marinka you said, is can can be kind of insular too, right? And why are models not really utilized? Um, you know, as we get generative models coming and you know we're designing new things, a lot of these models are not experimentally validated. They're just you know, cool, AURC is high, right? Like, like I, mean, I, think, I think to experimentalists, no one cares, right? Like, and there'll be a billion computational biology models, no one really cares. So what would you guys suggest for in this field, in molecular machine learning, the best way to, one, validate models, right? Whether it is computational benchmarks or experimental benchmarks or both, how do, you, how do computational students work with, or computational scientists work with experimentalists to make sure that their models are good and they're not just performing well in computational benchmarks. <clears throat> There's activity like, for example, the Structural Genomics Consortium. So they are planning to release in the future. Uh, maybe I should not, yeah, no, it's out. <laughs> I don't, I'm even not part of it, <laughs> just rumors. <laughs> um, benchmark data sets where people can participate, um, whereas, um, known compounds, tested activities, everything like that. So um, also in biological systems. So I think that would be the appropriate way to, to test afterwards model performance. Like more like what we have seen, the acceptance of AlphaFold was coming from the CAST challenge. So having more like public challenges like that, um, that gives credit to the models. That's the way to go, I guess. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I would also say that it's easier and easier for computational scientists to collaborate with biologists and chemists. Um, I would say like five, seven years ago, it was like me developing a new algorithm and then knocking on the doors of biologists and asking, I have a new algorithm, would you be willing to work with me? And I, I had to knock on 10 doors and one said yes. Nowadays, we are kind of entering this field where it's the opposite almost. Uh, so, so at least that's my experience. So it's like easier and easier if you kind of even do a, like a, send a cold, cold email to someone and say, I have this algorithm, I have predictions, can you validate them? And there's lots of interest from the experimental side into learning about AI, given the promise that, that AI is, uh, kind of is, is, is expected to deliver incentive discovery. Another thing that I would add is to think about ways for now um, um, provide uh, opening your models to experimentalists. It's still the case that many often when we do experimental validations at the end of the day, we're emailing each other some CSV tables mm -hmm. with some predictions, like two rows, three rows, or two columns, three columns, some prediction ID, some score that my algorithm will provide. And that's often not enough. So it's actually worthwhile to put a bit effort into designing perhaps like hugging face space, which is very easy nowadays to just kind of show, allow the expert to query the model a bit more or think about providing some explanations. That's also a fruitful uh, investment of time in my experience. Yeah, I just want to say they answered perfectly, so nothing to add. <laughs> yeah, great. So yeah, let's uh, thank the panelists. <laughs>